Thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you very much, the organizers, for, for the invitation. Um, I invented the name Blackfest as a short uh, name for this event. It's very nice. And um, so the sketch that you see here um, are uh, st setting the stage. So Casimir Polder is about small polarizable particles. We can talk about darker moments and the surface and uh, some at some distance. This sketch is a, is a quantum optics viewpoint, if you like. Uh, so this would be the case for two atoms. You go from ground states to some network of excited states and this vacuum uh, are vacuum states of the electromagnetic field. And here, uh, if you look carefully, you see the temperature uh, dependence appearing already at distances where you would not uh, expect it. And uh, so large distances are usually the region where you would expect temperature dependence to play a role. Um, at short distances, the standard folklore is that we have to deal with quantum fluctuations. So the talk will be, a, uh, I'm a theorist, um, there will be a few equations, I warn you. Um, and I will start with a short gallery of heads uh, of people who contributed to this field. And of course, since we are in Vienna, we are full of, uh, we are trenched in history here uh, with Boltzmann and, uh, and Mach and others. And so uh, these three guys here uh, does a funny uh, game with uh, capitals. Uh, Wilhelm Wien was not in Wien, but in b working in Berlin when he work, uh, was working the Wien law, of course. Uh, Jeans uh, found a correction to what I learned from to the Jail Jail Rayleigh Jeans law in 1905, which is after Planck, who did the interpolation between the two and found then an explanation of uh, uh, the blackbody radiation that we are celebrating this week. Uh, this is Fritz London. He also worked in Berlin, and uh, he worked out uh, from a quantum mechanical viewpoint how these interactions come about. So, uh, so the quantum mechanics was just f three years old, and they were applying quite advanced perturbation theory to work out what happens to atoms. Uh, and but also they had an effort of systematizing uh, things. So uh, he's really a very smart guy. So here's Casimir. Um, so in terms of Casimir Polar, we have to uh, talk about Casimir. The funny situation of uh, him is that he worked in this Philips research lab, not at the university. I found a picture of Polder, who also worked there, even 30 years later when he was working about heat transfer. Um, so Polder and, uh, uh, and the student Van Hove. Uh, here's John Seip, and he is, is also still alive uh, since 40 years. He's in Toronto, probably. And uh, he uses, uh, has pioneered the formalism uh, to compute these uh, interactions in a, a quite efficient way, where you see that, uh, well, you need quantum fluctuations and photons and all this, but it can be mapped to classical electromagnetism and essentially Green's functions. And so I owe uh, this formalism to John Seif. Uh, here we have two Russian people, Ritov and Lifshitz. They were kind of fighting, but although they were working in the same Academy of Sciences. Uh, Ritov developed a theory of uh, fluctuating electromagnetic fields. So if we think about uh, radiation uh, coming from hot sources as uh, chaotic light due to Brownian motion of sources that are electrically charged, uh, this is a fluctuating process. And uh, Ritov worked out the, uh, from an engineering viewpoint how you can model this in a, also in a fairly efficient and minimalistic way because you only need some information about the uh, conductivity of your materials, for example. So Lifshitz was the Lifshitz of Landau and Lifshitz, and he took up uh, the ideas of Ritov and developed them further. And here for the um, uh, 20, 2006 paper from Marie-Pascal Gorza in Paris, so the only lady here on my tableau, um, so she worked out uh, something that should have been obvious since uh, the papers by Seib, but she wrote it down in a careful way. How does yeah, how, how can we separate between equilibrium and non-equilibrium situations? And how does the temperature of the light field come in a natural way? So the elementary processes that we are going to talk about is simply like Einstein, absorption and emission, and how temperature goes into these processes. Okay, so let's see, that's roughly the overview. So there will be a kind of name dropping list uh, talking about Casimir and Polar and all that. Then I will uh, explain to you, this should be a tutorial about different uh, distance laws with uh, power laws with exponents and so on. Um, and then um, I will discuss in a bit more detail one example, which is an atom and a single surface. 
Uh, if you need uh, more resources from the theory side, so Jacques already introduced this fluctuation dissipation theorem for the electromagnetic field. So there's uh, even uh, some papers from the 50s where this has been written down. Um, it's very useful, and uh, Rietoff, uh, his fluctuation electrodynamics uh, and the theory by Lifshitz are also very useful. I will only touch very little on these. Maybe other people in the in the week will talk about uh, this. Uh. Okay, Brown in motion, I mentioned it as well. So Einstein's paper, 1917, it's on the quantum theory of radiation. Um, I will discuss this uh, as, a sec as an application here. Uh, it's related to current work I'm doing with colleagues who try to uh, uh, do very fundamental and a bit crazy experiments uh, with massive particles, which are larger than atoms, but still fairly small, and uh, explore the limits of quantum superpositions. And then when you explore these limits, you have to think about uh, processes that kill superposition. And the word that has been invented to, to translate that is, is decoherence. And uh, so it comes a bit exotic because you destroy quantum features by interacting with some big, huge field. But in the end, it boils down to some very elementary Brownian motion and in momentum space, momentum diffusion. And here, uh, uh, the last uh, topic of application will be a discussion in the field of Casimir forces. Uh, that's, I call it the thermal anomaly. Other people call it the plasma versus Drude controversy. So I will show you the, the big players and their arguments in that problem. Okay, so Casimir Polar. So the field that London tried to systematize is the field of dispersion forces. It arises between objects that have no net, net charge, but they carry dipole moments. So if these are permanent, you can orient them randomly, then you have some kind of non-polarized uh, mixture. But if you align them uh, with an ele electric field, for example, liquid crystals would be maybe an example, uh, then you get, can, can get orientation, another parameter that describes this alignment, and then you can have interactions. So a, a, guy, a, a, Danish, a Dutch guy, Kiesom, uh, developed these uh, forces. If these dipoles are dynamic, they can induce fields by their time dependence, and then we are in the field of Debye forces. And the Van der Waals uh, is the uh, realm of dispersion forces where these dipoles are purely induced. And so here's a... Uh, the overview of uh, different geometries, and again, the name dropping. So uh, probably I'm consistent with a, um, uh, a scheme that uh, Stefan Scheel maybe tried to develop or impose on the community. So he said, if we deal with atom and atom, we call it Van der Waals. Yeah? Although we know that Casimir Polder made a paper by treating retardation in this problem. And retardation means that this power law, 1 over r to the 6, which is purely electrostatic, uh, with some perturbation theory because these dipoles are induced, then goes over into the 1 to the r to the 7. So that has been observed in colloidal particles, and people were trying to understand this in, in Holland. Uh, and so um, um, uh, Kazmier and Polder worked out what happened at large distances, meaning when the um, uh, run time from, for light from one atom to the other becomes comparable to the typical transition frequencies. So here's a typical transition frequency. You see it in the denominator. And if you th think about the H bar here and uh, how this could uh, arise from quantum mechanical perturbation theory, so this is the energy of some virtual state that you go through by doing some higher order perturbation theory. So the name Van der Waals is atom and atom. If you take one atom and a macroscopic object, like a wall, then we are in the regime of Casimir Polar. So probably Kazem and Polo also worked out this problem. I, don't, I forgot my, my bibliography here on this point. But Stefan Scheel says that's the right name to, to use for this geometry. So then uh, as a function of distance, uh, let's call it Z, you have power loss for the short uh, distances. And then if your retardation comes in, retardation means finite propagation time for light, then you get to the 1 to the Z4. Here's again a typical uh, scaling with the, with the dipole moments. Uh, and here, finally, Casimir, without any, nobody else that's between two objects, for example, two plates. Then let's call L the distance. And again, you have different exponents uh, depending on the regime. And at short distances, you have here the plasma frequency as a typical scale in, the, in these uh, objects for a metal. And the one over the distance uh, squared. So Francesco had worked this uh, out in, in more detail in his thesis. Um, so a, a few words on these virtual dipoles. So that's an exotic quantum language. Uh, we, when I teach quantum theory, I always have a, a hard time to explain the difference between real and virtual, what does it really mean? And so 
uh, again, here's the, the formula. So uh, this scheme here that I mentioned, you could understand it. You have four arrows here, one, two, three, four, as a schematic for a fourth order perturbation theory. The fourth order perturbation, you knew, never do it yourself. You, you, you can read it by Eisenschitz and London. This is what they did. So five years after quantum mechanics was born, they were in the hard calculations with doing symmetry regroups and everything. And so imagine that here you have uh, two ground states and by the interaction with the field, you pop up here and excite one atom and create one photon. For sure you will say, no way, energy is not conserved. This must be a virtual process, okay? This photon can now be absorbed by the other atom. The photon is a delocalized object. And then the, it, uh, the other atom is excited, but the field again in the vacuum state. Then you cascade down with another virtual process and end up here. And in the end, if you co can concatenate all these processes, you end up with a formula for the interaction between these two atoms. In space time, if you like, or this is a kind of Feynman diagram, uh, this uh, very useful book uh, analyzes these diagrams. Of course, this is just a single diagram. You have to something like 15 to 20 to sum up to get the correct result. Uh, so you see one atom here being in the ground state, changing its state at this interaction vertex, becoming an excited atom and then going down here. And here these arrows symbolize uh, 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 photons that fly from one atom to the other. Okay, so now what about the temperature dependence? That's the topic of this meeting. So uh, I would say uh, here we are dealing with processes where real transitions are involved because you can absorb a real photon. It has some probability of existing in the Bose-Einstein distribution. And so uh, we have to deal with a sec further out regime of distances where the scaling of these interactions is again a bit weaker and depends on temperature. So if you look at numbers here, this for the Casimir polar atom wall, we are in the regime where potentials uh, potential shift of some energy level of an atom is in the gigahertz range. That's not very big. You need better, probably better do atomic spectroscopy to see this. Um, so um, this morning I told to Bettina, so we are working on the epsilon of the epsilon. Yeah? So these dispersion forces are weak and then we get, we talk about the correction to these forces. Uh, but okay, this is how science works. We look at these details uh, and try to understand them very carefully. Uh, for the Casimir force, this regime is again one to the d square. So uh, this constant here could sometimes be called the um, ha Hamaka constant, I think. Uh, and the typical force that you can derive is in this range here. Uh, so if you have a square centimeter of area, this looks like not very difficult to measure with an AFM, but uh, one centimeter is a huge object, in particular if you want to maintain it in parallel. So experimentalists will maybe address this challenge um, because it's really hard. Okay, so a physical picture. So these were roughly the power laws. So what, what is the physics uh, behind these processes? And in this and the following slide, here's the other color. You are going to see two viewpoints. Rather, rather one is more matter-centered and the other one more field-centered. Um, and in a sense, uh, what Casimir did is um, putting more emphasis on the field side. So he said these two plates interact because they confine the fluctuations of the field. Um, and then the whole community of quantum field theory jumped on this topic and were developing different geometries and exotic uh, applications. But historically, what London and Eisenschitz did, they started with matter fluctuations. And matter is composed of particles that are charged. And so there is the possibility that you have a, a, a dipole appearing here. So spontaneously, if you like, yeah, so you could think about and electrons in a noble gas atom and to pick one atom and one electron here, it is not right at the center. So there's some, in this instantaneous position, there is a dipole moment, but of course this electron will evolve around as wave functions and we're dealing with a virtual thing. Uh, it's not easy to say. Okay, so in this viewpoint here, you will switch to classical electrodynamics. This dipole is radiating a field. Roughly here are the field lines at this position here of another uh, atom. This is the electric field, one over R3 is the power law at short distance. And then this one, uh, this field can polarize with the polarizability alpha, uh, the second atom. Now you have a di dipole moment, which is an induced one, induced by the fluctuations of the first. Okay, this is the same dipole here. Now you play back the game, uh, field lines, and work out what is the field of this dipole at this first here. And then you can define an interaction by the interaction between this field and this dipole here. So averaging over the fluctuations of D, because it's some spontaneous process, 
This field is indirectly correlated with its sources, so there's a non-zero average, and uh, you will get uh, a result uh, if you do all the calculations which are intermediate. So there are nasty things where field theorists love to indulge about tracking what the kind of regularization and infinities you have to deal with. So just a, a hint of these uh, infinities, um, if you talk about the dipole, you probably have in mind you have two levels and then you jump from one to the other and they are connected by some transition. But actually, a significant percentage of these uh, interactions also arise from continuum states. And they are infinitely high in energy, so you have to deal with these integrations if they don't converge. Okay, so this is the field picture. Imagine that you have a field that is there. It could be the vacuum field, if you like to think about it in terms of some fancy virtual photons hovering around all over space, or our ordinary blackbody field, which is some decent photon number. And then uh, this field is, of course, uh, present at both positions. Uh, waves are extended, and they are also correlated, because, as Jean-Jacques told us, even the blackbody field has some finite correlation there. Okay, so now you have dipoles that are induced by this field and they are also correlated. You play once the trick here that uh, these fields play, generate fields and work out now the interaction in this picture here. And you see the correct scaling, polarizability alpha 1, 2, and the correlation function of the field. And that correlation function gives you an additional distance dependence. So the factor 1 over R6 in the non-retarded regime comes about by working out this field correlation function. Again, you have to integrate over the mode spectrum of all the frequencies of the field, uh, and again, have to deal with infinities that appear here. Okay, so let's a bit look more in detail into the atom wall uh, mathematics. So I, uh, all these formulas to uh, Wiley and Seip and Marie-Pascal Gorzard will enter in the second slide with a nice way of introducing temperature. So uh, there's a way of writing these uh, interactions as a sum over uh, imaginary frequencies. That's something fairly crazy, but it's numerically e extremely useful because if you think about, let's say, fields and uh, the radiation of sources, they generate waves. Waves oscillate in space. They may be even long range, one over R, far field uh, sources. And of course, that is uh, awful to compute numerically. Uh, if you have to integrate over all these frequencies, this oscillating long range and so on. If you switch to imaginary frequencies, these Green's functions will decay very rapidly in space because well, they are generated by these very funny frequencies. Okay, that's of course a, a mag the, ma the magic mathematics of doing contour integration uh, and looking for poles of the Bose-Einstein denominator here, the exponent here has zeros if omega is imaginary and this uh, Matsubara is the name for these frequencies. And so these things blow up in the complex plane if you if, uh, play around with contours and so on, and you pick up poles from these uh, frequencies here, and then you can write a, a whole thing, the whole integration over frequencies in terms of, s of summation over these imaginary things. Okay, so this is the summation here. Uh, there's an, here's the polarizabili polarizability. Uh, so we only, I take here the, as the lowest order the electric dipole polarizability, but if you think about it more carefully, there are higher multipoles, magnetic dipoles and so on. Uh, and so the definition of this polarizability is if there is a field, it induces a dipole moment. In general, it's a tensor. In many simple cases, it's uh, isotropic, but that depends on the atomic quantum states that you are dealing with. Okay, here's the magnetic, electromagnetic Green's function. It is also a response function. If you take a dipole, you reverse the roles at R prime. It generates a field at position R. Again, a tensor. And here it's uh, is, is not, not symmetric because of the difference in geometry. Right? If you have distance here, distance there, dipoles, and so on. Okay, here's an example of uh, this uh, Green's function uh, for the simple case of a planar object. Um, so the geometry of uh, your situation, your experimental setup, is encoded, electromagnetically speaking, in this Green's function, and in the way these objects uh, scatter light. That's, a, of course, an approximation, because you use some ideas of scattering theory for electromagnetic waves that react with this uh, wall here. But, okay, in this uh, simple geometry, you can work out this Green's function as some integration. Uh, here, R, P, and R, S are reflection amplitudes uh, for the two polarizations. So, did you call them T, E, and T, M? Yes, so I call them P and S, uh, communities uh, that have to agree and learn 
to this, teach the students these names. Okay, um, so they, if you plot these functions, they are oscillating, decaying, not very fancy. Uh, because of the integration here, nothing uh, happened. Okay, now Marie Pascal Gorza. So she asked the question, what happens if um, we play a bit more carefully uh, uh, dealing with temperature and uh, on the atomic side with a given state for the atom, a given quantum state. So in the formula before, I was writing down F as a free energy of interaction, thermodynamics language. And here, uh, this F uh, should be get a label little a that's here in the polarizability. Now that's the polarizability of a given uh, state, a given level of, of the atom. And um, um, in this case, you are not, you can ask the question, the atom may be not in the same temperature as the field. Maybe prepared by some laser cooling schemes in the ground state, and you know for sure it's not in the excited state. Then uh, there are uh, possibilities uh, of extra interactions, and they can be written in terms of the real part of the squeeze function here. And I call them, well, Marie Pascal calls them resonance shifts. So uh, they are essentially related to the fact that if there are photons present in the black body field, they can absorbed, be absorbed, re-emitted. Yeah, so you could call this real or virtual as you like. Um, but uh, this process is also accompanied by some energy shift. And it's simply the real part of this Green's function that gives you this. Uh, and uh, if you go for emission, then you see here, like Einstein would say it, uh, n plus one, spontaneous and stimulated, uh, is for the downward process. So energy levels below this state here have uh, this additional probability. And there's a plus and minus sign. Yeah? So it could be that even if these, these terms cancel, they cancel exactly if the atom has populations that are Boltzmann distributed, Boltzmann distributed, as we say here, uh, uh, according to the same temperature as the field. Then also all these photon numbers here, they cancel out uh, nicely. Um, but uh, if you imagine that, for example, these transition frequencies, they are kind of equidistant. This happens in some situations. Then there can also be cancellations. And so uh, Stefan Scheel and his colleagues, uh, they wrote a paper on this. Okay. Now, these complex frequencies, just a sketch here if you've never seen this before. Uh, so here are the Matsubara frequencies. That's the complex frequency plane. Uh, so there are poles in the Bose-Einstein uh, function. Here are poles in the polarizability. They are appear at the resonances of an atom. Typically, they are in the visible. Here, the infrared spectrum for room temperature black body radiation is much lower. So they are kind of separation of scales here. For the Green's functions, as I uh, sketched you before in words, here are the formulas. If you were evaluated here on this Matsubara pole, imaginary, then you have an exponential decay, a kind of Yukawa interaction. And here in the on real frequencies, it's an oscillating function. So Bettina and uh, Victoria and others may use this formalism to compute interactions in uh, more interesting situations. Okay. Well, now about the distance dependence, as an example again from, from these two uh, uh, dipole and the wall. Um, you have to distinguish a little bit between dipoles that are parallel and uh, perpendicular to the surface. So Jean-Jacques, this is our surface here. If a dipole is parallel like this, you can think about the image dipole, it's below the desk and it looks like this. Yeah, That's the plus and minus switch to play. And now you can think about how these two in dipoles interact. And if you have the other situation, the perpendicular one, it's this way. Yeah? And it turns out that uh, there's essentially a factor two between the two. Uh, and so the, the total transition summing over uh, these two dipole orientations is giving like this. And um, so people were discussing um, um, what you should actually take here if epsilon, that is the material permittivity of your, of your wall, uh, is evaluated at zero frequency. So this formula comes out by taking this Matsubara summation at the pole at zero frequency. And now uh, the question arises, now is your material conducting yes or no? If it's not conducting, you take the static permittivity uh, and you, you work it out. If it's conducting, but maybe some just little tiny epsilon conducting, well, I don't know, thermally excited by band, valence band electrons or so, then there is some small term which goes like one over omega in the, in the permittivity. And it should go infinity, and then you could, you, this term should be one. Yeah, so there's a kind of discontinuity of taking the conductivity finite, frequency going to zero, and the other way around. The, the two limits do not commute. 
And uh, so people have been fighting about what is the correct way to do. Yeah? So we published a paper with a more complicated model where uh, depending on the physical effects like screening, you could actually switch from one to the other. Um, okay, here's the term with resonant absorption. So you uh, recognize in front this indeed the static polarizability of, of this uh, two-level system. And the other terms here look very similar to this one here. And uh, since they come with opposite signs, they could also cancel depending on the frequency dispersion in your material. And uh, so the group in, uh, of Marie Pascal, they work on spectroscopy with sapphire surfaces, and they really have to deal with this. Okay, so I'm stopping here and going to the, the research uh, part of it. And uh, so this is our favorite black body. And the spectrum of it, it's fairly well-defined temperature, 577 Kelvin. And the other favorite black body spectrum is uh, that of the universe itself. That's the COBE spectrum here with a very, very accurate temperature uh, that you can uh, give to few digits. So it's, it's not given here, but the, you, the, the, so the temperature fluctuations are at the level of 10 to minus 4 or 5 Kelvin. And of course, you could say uh, the, fav the favorite phenomenon due to black radiation are we. It's us. Uh, um, OK. so. Um, the main thermal anomaly is a discussion about uh, computing the Casimir interaction between metals and taking into account both the fact that they are at finite temperature, so that fits into those conference, and that they, they have a finite conductivity. <coughs> so it's a kind of lossy material. If it were not lossy, it would not radiate. So also this conference is living from this phenomenon. And um, so what we are going to, uh, what we have been doing in the last few years is to play with, with, with non-standard boundary conditions. So I will explain to you why we took this liberty and then what we got out of it. And the other topic is about uh, decoherence due to black body radiation. So that appears if you want to try to um, understand the uh, quantum mechanics of a nanoparticle <coughs> and the processes that intervene when you have a black body radiation. Would be scattering or absorption. <coughs> okay, so um, this anomaly arises because the normal uh, expectation you have is that these thermal effects are a small correction to vacuum effects that appear at short distances, high frequencies. And um, so normally um, only the Wien wavelength here, 8 micron or so, is uh, giving you the length scale where these effects enter the game. <coughs> so they have been observed at shorter distances. And so here are two plots uh, with examples. So the one by Marie Pascal, you saw it already. So this is the uh, Van der Waals, uh, Kasim sorry, Casimir polar shift multiplied by Z to the three. So all these power laws become constants. Yeah? So for example, here the zero Kelvin power law is this one here. Uh, this is the uh, power law that you can compute for 300 Kelvin, but the actual calculation uh, fairly rapidly deviates, and if you ask for now 10% in relative variation, you can see it if you look here at 0.1 micrometers, which is very far below the Wien wavelength, which is 8 microns. So uh, here already we see that probably with factors of 2 pi, we should be kind of generous, because the, uh, the long distance law, which is given by this uh, temperature dependent term, is already reached for 1 or 2 micrometers. At 600 Kelvin, it's even earlier. This is the case for the plate and the plate. So there are many curves here, and let's focus on the two of them here. So this dark one here is the calculation of the uh, Casimir interaction using the standard um, dielectric function conductivity of, of gold. Uh, and you see here uh, a, a significant difference with respect to zero temperature, which is the dotted line, which is this one here. So already here at one micron, um, there's a significant uh, factor two or so uh, difference between the two curves, and people were trying to understand why this is so. Yeah? So normally, only this large distance behavior here, where you have a different uh, power law, uh, you would expect this, but it already appeared here at very relatively short distance. So now, there's a end slide with di different arguments, yeah? and so people were saying, okay, you do it wrong, your calculations are wrong. Be careful with taking limits. Yeah? But on the other hand, certain limits have only been used to check whether your large distance regime is right or not. And if you are applying your formula beyond that limit, maybe at shorter distance, yeah, there's no reason to say that limit is, is wrong. And um, OK, so probably it's not an error. 
it's not an error. It has been in the formula since Lifshitz. Nobody looked at it uh, very carefully uh, before 2000. Uh, who is responsible for these kind of anomalous temperature dependence? And so the consensus that has emerged is that um, you have to look into near fields and you have to in, in look into polarizations or let's say configurations of field geometries that are related to magnetic fields. That's not very surprising for metals because they're good conductors. There are lots of current that is possible there. It's also thermally excited. And so they generate magnetic fields. Um, okay, another theorist's um, discussion is, does the NAND theorem hold? So th this is, a, this is uh, the question, does the entropy go to zero? So I told you this free energy of the Casimir Polder term and this uh, dependence on the conductivity. If you work out carefully uh, how the entropy behaves by taking some derivatives according to thermodynamics, uh, it may happen that this entropy does not go to zero, and then this uh, model would disqualify, because this is uh, Nernst's theorem. Nernst, he was also working not in Vienna, but in Berlin. Um, okay, and uh, so we also worked a little bit on understanding this better, and uh, even um, uh, finding a way of saying, Nernst, you are a good guy, but there are certain systems where your theorem does not apply, and this is why it doesn't hold. Yeah, so that's a nice story. Okay, in experiments, something from 97 roughly, uh, we got more and more precise data, and indeed it was observed that the standard Lipschitz theory uh, deviates at the level of 10, 20% with respect to these data. So that's the um, uh, anomaly with respect to experiments. And so the plasma model is a way to uh, b find a better agreement at relatively short distance, but if you go to large distance, it, it's okay. There's one experiment here, this one here, Sushko, where they found a large distance, uh, uh, a better agreement, but it's a very difficult experiment because the forces are very weak at these distances. Okay, so what are the current uh, arguments to improve the situation? Maybe we should forget about conductivity and use this plasma model. So I find this very, very unphysical because metal is a conductor, it's not a superconductor. Um, uh, do electric current saturate? Do we have to talk about, talk about Fermi saturations, Pauli principle for electrons that move around in the metal? There are many, okay. But uh, maybe with a low brightness that black body radiation is endowed with, uh, th this effect is very far from happening. So I don't really believe in this. Um, in experimental side, you have to do very careful calibrations because uh, even though you work with metals to have some definite ground potential, yeah, there are still some patch potentials and charges that are around. And spatial dispersion is also an issue. Uh, so Martina, for example, will talk about this, right? Right? A little bit, okay. Um, okay, so uh, my motivation here to do it um, in a bit more um, uh, non-standard way uh, so this, the strange situation that we're dealing with here is the following. Imagine you have a, a source here of thermal radiation, so its spectrum is roughly of the order KBT in frequency. Okay? But if you are close with this object to, uh, to, to the surface, the spatial pattern of the fields generated by this uh, object is, so we call this the wavelength, the spatial pattern, is of the order of the distance to the, between source and, and surface. And so, uh, in, in, in usual uh, numbers, yeah. So the, this would be give you the V wavelength. Uh, and here, the distance CAD is much much smaller than the V wavelength. The two do not fit at all. So the spatial and the temporal characteristics are very far from the usual situation of, let's say, infrared spectroscopy. So if you uh, plot this in terms of k and omega, so you are not at all within the light cone, but way away below here. So that's the realm of evanescent modes. And in this region here, there are um, eddy currents or diffusive magnetic fields that propagate even thermally in a metal. Um, okay, uh, here's a, a plot I showed a few years ago, uh, again in this K and omega plane where these contours give you a way of, uh, an idea of uh, how large is the contribution of these modes to a relevant Casimir observable, like the energy between two plates. And there are funny lines here with uh, this diffusion coefficient that is related to this magnetic diffusivity that can be drawn to make sense out of these funny shapes. Uh, here's a calculation from a student uh, uh, recently where we were playing with a different way of setting up a boundary condition. If you have currents close to a metal surface, 
Um, and uh, so this plot here is showing you uh, this blue line is the calculation uh, of uh, contribution, certain contribution to the Cartesian pressure due to a very restricted range of polarization and frequencies. So just the thermal part of it, yeah, it's a partial pressure. And so this uh, blue line here gets uh, reduced if you change to a different description. And these data points uh, try to illustrate that this blue line here is actually kind of the bad guy because, because it also gives you the difference between the Druda model and the experimental data. So this, uh, these data points have been uh, published. Uh, and so we were, far, we were happy that they were lying on this, on this local Druda model and then we could then reduce here. Um, okay. Um, so this decoherence part, I'm running out of time. So I will go to you uh, to one example here, this one here. So this paper by Einstein is really amazing. So you should read Daniel Kleppner's uh, uh, rereading Einstein. So he does not only introduce A and B coefficients and uh, getting you the blackbody spectrum from that, but also talking about the recoil of uh, momentum. Yeah, atoms that emit a photon and recoil momentum and they get a change in their velocity distribution due to that. And the idea of Einstein was you only get Maxwell Boltzmann distribution if the radiation spectrum has the Planck form, which is another way of saying, uh, well, Planck is correct, but from a different viewpoint, in a different way. And so uh, there are two distributions, two contributions. If you ask for the distribution function f of p of a particle as it exchanges momentum uh, due to scattering from light. So one is if the atom is moving, it feels a friction force. So this is the friction force that can be seen by the Earth moving through blackbody radiation, the famous dipole of the Cobe spectrum. So we are moving with 600 kilometers per second by Virgo or somewhere in the universe so with respect to this reference frame uh, provided by the bi microwave background. So there will be people talking about this and cosmology uh, uh, later. And if the atom is at rest, there is momentum diffusion. So this is a standard formula from Brown in motion. And Einstein, having worked on Brown in motion, knew how to do compute this. So the temperature and this friction coefficient gamma, they are related, giving you the diffusion coefficient. And here you see how a, moment, a, a momentum distribution gets wider and is shifting from a non-zero center to a zero center. And here's the equilibrium thing. So this has been translated into uh, spatial coherence by uh, Ole Steuernagel uh, in the 90s already. And uh, so in a sense, uh, it's like uh, Wiener Kinschi, what you mentioned. If you talk about coherence in space, it's the Fourier transform of a K distribution. And here talking about momentum and quantum mechanics, it's the momentum distribution. So it's Fourier transform gives you a length, which is the coherence length. And uh, that's the way of understanding why um, uh, if you make this momentum uncertain, you, you reduce uh, the spatial coherence. Okay, I will stop here. Um, Here's the conclusion. Uh, so ask me about this guy here uh, if you want more details. And I thank you for your attention.